Hey, this is Bill Kennedy. This is the second video in our series. Hopefully you've watched the first video where I showed you how to hand craft a vector embedding of five different features and how we could use that cosine similarity to see how those features sort of were similar to the other features. Uh, but I also shared with you that trying to do something like that by hand is really impossible, right? Like good for demo, not good for real life. So on this video, we're going to take that same data set that we were playing with, but we're going to use an LLM embedding model to do the vector embedding and then run it through our cosine similarity functions. And we expect, I expect that we're going to get the same results, but this time we're, we're able to use something um, that is much more production, right? Much more powerful. So let's take a look at that. Now, before you get started, though, you've got to be able to run Olama. Olama is a model server that we can run locally. So if you haven't done this already, um, Brew is the best way to do it. Go and install the Olama model server. I've already done that. So once you've got that downloaded and installed, I've got this dev Olama up command, which sort of starts the server for me. I'm going to do that up here. The model server is no good without models. So if you run Olama list, you can see that I've already downloaded a bunch of models that we'll play with with all these exercises. This is the model that I want to use for embedding. It's a really nice model. It works really, really well. You can see it's fairly large. Oh, actually, it's less than a gig, so maybe it's not that bad. Um, but this is the model that we need. So you will see in the make file an Olama pull command. Um, we could even just take this one out for now, since that's all we need for this video. And you'll see that mine already says 100%. So um, I need you to go and download Olama. You can go to the Olama website if you don't want to use Brew. Then I need you to do that Olama pull. Um, go ahead and do that. You can put me on pause. And then when you get back, um, we can have a lot more fun. Okay, I'm assuming you're back already. You've got everything running. You did an Olama list and you saw your MXBAI embed large model there. So now we can get going. Now that model is specific to being able to create vector embeddings. And the thing to understand about the vector embeddings is that there's really um, three types of models that you can use. You have those models that are specific to just text embedding. This one is specific to text and Olama only has these text specific ones. There are models out there that can work with just images and creating vector embeddings for images. And then there are those that can do both. Um, Prediction Guard is a company that has an API set that allows you to do embeddings for both text and images. Okay, so instead of using our handcrafted embeddings, we're going to use the model to do that. So let's see some changes that we're going to add from the last video. So our data now is going to be a name like horse, man, woman, king. Um, but instead of the five different features with those embedding numbers, we're just going to use plain straight text. And then I'm going to capture the vector embedding in this slice of floats. And in our case, we're going to have um, 1024 of these unique data points instead of just the five. So it should be a little more accurate. There's a, a great package out there called Langchain Go. It, it has a package called Olama that lets us talk to Olama directly. Um, it's pretty nice. I just want you to know you don't need these types of packages, though. All the model servers basically expose an HTTP endpoint set of APIs. In fact, you see some of them already here. And so you could always talk to any model in just about any language that supports HTTP. The calls are fairly basic, honestly. But Langchain is a cool little project in Go that's trying to abstract the, the heavy dutyness of some of the calls and, and gives you things. So I think it's fair to use that. But don't feel like if it, if something's missing in terms of feature functionality, you can always go and talk to the model directly over HTTP and look at the calls. In this case, I'm going to use Langchain. I'm going to say we've got a new Olama, and we're going to use this embedding model specifically for it. So what that's going to end up returning is an, an LLM, a pointer to an LLM, which is an API that lets us interact with Olama for that particular model. Here's our vector data. You can see I've changed it up a little bit. Before, when we looked at the vector data, 
right? I was defining these different features and assigning a vector number to those. And that's how we, we did it before. But since I want the LLM to do it, what I got to do is present it with sort of data content um, that will give us the same sort of feature functionality. So what I've done is I've just converted some of those numbers to really just words, right? So a horse is just an animal and we're keeping the horse as a female, but a man is human, male, pants, poor. You see what I'm doing here, right? And I can even make this more rich by adding more sort of features related to it. But for our purposes here, this is, this is just fine. These sort of five features that we have here. The idea is to take this text for each of these elements here and call the Olama model server with that input to get back the vector embedding. And again, this will be a thousand, an array of a thousand floating point numbers trying to represent that data in that vector space, right? So again, every time that we ask the model for one of this, this vector, it's similar to it plotting it in this sort of three-dimensional space, even though our vector is in 1,024-dimensional <laughs> space, which is really hard to sort of plot in three-dimensional space, isn't it? Um, but just to keep our brain from exploding, we're asking the model now to sort of embed this in space. I'll iterate over each data point, calling create embedded. Now, the create embedding will take a batch. I could have fed all of this data in one shot, I just keep it simple, I'm not doing that. So we're gonna call it for each piece of text. We're gonna get back a vector. I'm gonna store that vector right there. Um, and then we'll have the, the data points. Now, once we have vectors for each of our data points, we can do what we did before in the first example, just iterate over every data point, use our vector similarity function um, with the vector information that we got back from the LLM, and we should see similar results, right? So, so let's do the following. I have that running. Let's run the um, first example again. So in the first example with our sort of hard-coded embedding, we saw that, you know, we've got the horse, the man is a good one to look at. Uh, we'll try to compare these in, in a second. This time, let's run example two and we'll sort of compare what we've got. So you can see that we called the API embedding endpoint a few times. And we got back sort of similar results, but this time using embeddings from the model. Why don't we do this just to sort of start? I'm gonna take the original man um, that we have here. Maybe what I'll do is I'll add a, um, you know, just a temp.txt file. So we'll have something to look at here. So that was the original um, data set. Um, let's take a look at the new one using the vector embeddings. So what do we see here? I mean, I, I was hoping to see um, some more accuracy. And I think for sure we see that accuracy even just between what a man and a woman is, right? Like, it makes more sense that a man and a woman is maybe 80% similar. Again, even with our very small sort of representation of what a man and a woman is, these numbers just feel so much better, don't they? And that's the beauty of using one of these embedding models that, that, that have calculated over time enough sort of feature points to give us some level of accuracy, right? Let's take a look also at maybe um, King. So here's the original King and here's the new King. And again, I think we will see that there's much more accuracy now in our similarity. Uh, much nicer, right? The more features we have, the, the better that should be. I think the last thing to look at was our, uh, the classic formula, right? Of king minus man plus woman. On our little five point data set from the first example, we had 100% similarity, but as I expect, a little bit more accurate this time. Now we're like, I say 97%, but it's working, right? I mean, look at what we did here. And we didn't have to try to hand code a set of sort of features anymore. What we did is we found some content that we believed was 
um, relevant to what a man is, relevant to what a woman is, relevant to what a king and a queen is. And this could even be better content, right? We just kind of have a small piece of it. But because of this content being, uh, let's say, accurate in terms of these five data points, we, we're getting better, uh, let me show, show you here, getting better um, similarity results. And so you can see here how you know, leveraging one of these embedding models gives us the accuracy we need for similarity without having to sort of hand code it. It's really going to be now about how rich the data is for our purposes, right? If the data is rich and it's, and it's very, we believe it's really accurate in terms of what it's trying to describe, we're going to get some good results. If it's very vague and generalized, we, we, we probably won't. I think this is a great example of how we don't have to worry about the hand, you know, having to hand code these things. As the next step, what I want to do is play with the word to vec model. Google has a, a model out there, um, all built in code so we can play with it locally. And what's cool about this model is that we can train it with our own vocabulary to do some of the same things. And this isn't anything I'd run in production, but it would, it's going to give us a, a little bit of an understanding of how we could take a, a model that is uh, specialized, in this case, say, taking words and vectorizing them and being able to sort of train that ourselves. So that, that's what we're going to do next, sort of in the scope of us learning how these vector databases and models work.